Welcome to our next lecture in the series on condensed matter theory. In this video, I want to discuss an example where we have an S and a an P orbital, or only one of the three, the PZ in the direction of the chain, on a one-dimensional chain. And with this model, we can actually reproduce uh, the free electron bands really, really accurate when we only include nearest neighbor hopping interactions. So let's see how this works. We make a lattice in one dimension with lattice constant A, such that the length of the vector A is A. We have a basis where we have an S orbital and an PZ orbital. Then we can have a look at our hopping matrix elements and we can hop either from the S orbital to the S orbital, which is the integral SS sigma and what we saw before, SS sigma is smaller than zero. Then we can hop from the P orbital to the P orbital and again, phases of the wave functions are important because they determine the sign of your hopping matrix elements. And you can hop in both directions. And this is from a P to a P orbital, making a sigma bond. And PP sigma has a plus lobe to a minus lobe that gives me a minus sign compared to SS sigma. So PP sigma is larger than zero. Then we can hop from an S to a P orbital, giving rise to the matrix element S, P, sigma. It's a plus sign to a minus sign lobe, so a positive matrix element. And we can either hop from the S to the P or from the P to the S. One is in the positive Z direction, the other is in the negative Z direction. There is Another matrix element, which of course by symmetry is related to the one that we had before, but that is going from the P to the S. So P S sigma, and this is equal to S P sigma with a minus sign, because here I have a plus lobe pointing towards a plus lobe. So this is minus S P sigma, and therefore smaller than zero. We'll use S P sigma as the matrix element, with an additional minus sign for the hopping to the left. So let's have a look at our Hamiltonian. And first we do this in real space. Our Hamiltonian is a sum over all lattice vectors, the on-site energy for the pz orbital, where we count the number of pz electrons that we have at site r, plus the on-site energy for the s orbital, where we count the number of s electrons that we have at position r summed over all lattices vectors. Then we have the hopping from the p orbital, a dagger pz, R plus A, A PZ at R plus the Hermitian conjugate. We have the hopping for the S orbital, A dagger S at R plus A, A S at R plus the Hermitian conjugate. And we have the hopping between the S and the P orbital, A dagger PZ at R plus A. A S at R plus Hamiltonian conjugate minus A dagger S at R plus A A P at R plus Hamiltonian conjugate. We can now Fourier transform this to K space. Very important that we have this minus sign here. 
and in case space we find the sum over all reciprocal lattice factors, no, over all momenta, it's still not reciprocal lattice factors, I don't know what I have today. <laughs> Epsilon Pz plus Pp sigma e to the i Ka plus e to the minus i Ka, and I'm not going to simplify this to cosine and sines yet because I want to show you where things come from. A dagger Pz Ka Pz K. Plus, and the same for the s orbital, ss sigma e to the i ka plus e to the minus i ka e dagger s k a s k. And then we have the interaction between the s and the p orbital, sp sigma e to the minus i. Ka minus e to the i Ka, because hopping to the left and to the right gives you the opposite sign. And then a dagger pz k a s k minus a dagger s k a pz k. Well, this looks odd because you change sign when you and we can conjugate, but the prefactor is complex, so that is okay when you have a Hermitian Hamiltonian. So now let's simplify things, put in the cosine and sine functions. We have an epsilon pz plus 2 pp sigma cosine ka dispersion for the pz orbital. We have an epsilon s plus 2 ss sigma cosine ka dispersion for the s orbital. And we have an interaction minus 2i sp sigma sine ka a dagger pz ka s k minus a dagger s k a pz k. So we can write down our Hamiltonian as a matrix a dagger s k a pz k and then the matrix epsilon s plus 2 s s sigma cosine k a the interaction between them to i s p sigma sine k a minus 2 i s p sigma sine k a and epsilon p z plus 2 p p sigma cosine k a for the dispersion of the p orbital and then of course the a s k a Pz k for the annihilation, such that we have the same Hamiltonian as we had before. If we plot our band structure as a function of crystal momentum minus pi over a to pi over a, and then the band energy, we have the s orbital giving rise to an S-band. We have the Pz orbital giving rise to a Pz-band. And once we turn on the interaction, then we get level repulsion. But we should be very careful now, because we have a sinus Ka in front, which means that when K is zero, or pi over a, that prefactor is zero, and therefore at those points in k-space, your bands will not change. And of course here we have an interaction, so you get level repulsion 
and we have a new dispersion that emerges. in there. Now how can we use this to make free electron bands? Oh, by the way, it is this not mixing between even and odd orbitals that will give rise to topolo topology effects um, that we can discuss later on in this lecture. But what I want to discuss here is how this can give rise to free electron-like bands. So there are a few things that we need to consider when we make free electron-like bands. And what we want is an energy momentum dispersion that is roughly equal to h bar square k square over 2m. That means that we get kinks at the wave vector pi over a unless we have two bands that are degenerate. So I want to have degenerate states at the crystal momentum plus minus pi over a. Normally when you have two bands and their bare interaction is degenerate and you turn on a coupling between them, they will split. So you would have to have extreme luck of parameter tuning to get these accidental degeneracies. The nice thing of having an S and a P band that are degenerate is that exactly at the zone boundary you have a four prefactor sine k over k times a, which is going to be zero at these points in k space. So I can start with bare bands without this interaction that are degenerate. So I have my tight binding S band. Minus pi over A to pi over A. S band. Let's make sure that I have a slight So there is the S-band back in the screen again. And then we have a P-band and I want it to be degenerate at these points. But of course my dispersion is opposite because PP sigma has the opposite sign from SP sigma. And there we go. So that of course is not yet looking like free electron like bands. And the PZ band. And here we have SP sigma is zero. Now when we turn on SP sigma, I have to make sure that at these points in K space, we do not move and stay degenerate. And we now Turn on SP sigma, you get level repulsion here. It's going to be larger where the energy difference is small. So we get a linear dependence in the beginning. And that's how it is going to disperse. And that looks reasonably well parabolic already. So let's give you one example that we can choose. Let's take units of pi square h bar square over 4 a square m, such that we get back to dispersions that are parabolic with h bar squared k square over 2 m in the beginning. If we now take epsilon s is 1, to SS sigma is minus 1, epsilon p is 3, and 2 pp sigma is plus 1, such that we have the bare bands that you show here, the same bandwidth, just an energy difference, such that you're degenerate at pi over a and minus pi over a. 
and we now turn on SP Sigma of 1 then our dispersion actually is going to be really nice and simple if you diagonalize this then E1 the lowest bound then becomes 2 1 minus cosine Ka over 2 and the upper band becomes 2 times 1 plus cosine Ka over 2. Well, if you now make a Taylor series, you will find that this has indeed the correct dispersion plus 2, k is 0, but of course it's still not perfect. You still have the higher orders in there. Um, actually, we have a few more degrees of freedom that we can choose. We can still optimize sp sigma, for example, to say that you want to have the dispersion at one other point to agree with the free electron like dispersion or that you want to have the derivative at pi over a to be equal to the free electron like dispersion. And at that point you really become already quite close uh, within the percent level of the free electron like band dispersion. And this is purely just the nearest neighbor type binding model that then represents a free electron like state, at least for the lowest band when you include only S and P like orbitals. Um, in the next set of lectures we will have a look at the alkali metals and this is exactly what happens there. Um, and what you then of course can try to discuss is why does this happen? Why is the atomic physics here um, at the same point optimized where you get close to free electron like bands? And that's a, a really nice quirk of nature to just pick those lattice constants, such that you optimize both your kinetic energy and your atomic-like wave functions. Or other sides, they said, um, these metals really allow you to optimize both the kinetic energy as well as the atomic energies at the same time. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, we see each other uh, in the next series of videos. Stay healthy.